as being a part of fire prone areas, waterways protection, along with restoring waterways. Caring for country is for everyone. It's not only an obligation and a right, but it's also an absolute privilege. I wish everyone the very best here this evening. Thank you all very much for having me a part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Emma, for your welcome to country. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, that we are gathered here uh, on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung land, a land of the Kulin Nations, and pay uh, my respects to the elders of this land, past and present, and also to acknowledge uh, all people of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, background uh, in our audience today. It's our privilege to walk together uh, and to learn together on country. And so we thank you very much for your welcome. Colleagues, we're joined today by around 300 guests in the theatre, uh, perhaps a, a few less uh, now, given some of the uh, COVID uh, situations that are playing out around the country. But we know we've got many more who are joining us uh, by Zoom for the inaugural lecture of the Carmichael Centre. The Carmichael Centre uh, is a centre that's been set up um, to continue research and education work in the spirit of Laurie Carmichael, the former leader of the Metal Workers Union uh, and the ACTU. And unfortunately, some of the advisory committee members uh, have been unable to join us in person, and I'd just like to acknowledge their commitment to our work before we begin, because I'm sure they're watching online. So a big shout out to Doug Cameron, our chair, uh, to Laurie Carmichael Jr., to Don Sutherland and Andrew Detmar. I'd now like to invite uh, Vice-Chancellor and President of RMIT University, uh, Professor Alec Cameron, to speak. Welcome. Thank you, Karina, and thank you, Emma, for your welcome to country. I'd also like to acknowledge our esteemed keynote speaker and guest, Nobel Laureate in Economics, Professor Joe Stiglitz, who, of course, you've all come to listen to. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege as Vice-Chancellor and President of RMIT University to welcome you all to the Capitol. This iconic Burley Griffin-designed theatre was recently restored to become, once again, one of the city's most extraordinary venues and a place of hands-on learning for our creative students. So we are proud, indeed, to be your host for this inaugural Laurie Carmichael Lecture. As a university founded on a promise to empower working people, raise their voices, and prepare them for the world of work, we share a natural connection with the legacy of Laurie Carmichael. And this lecture series is part of an ongoing collaboration between RMIT and the Carmichael Centre within the Australian Institute, built on a shared belief that research should generate positive, Im positive social impact. A belief that I believe is shared by our co-participants co at this evening's event, the Victorian Government and the Department of Education and Training, as well as the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union, and the Australian Education Union. Before I close, I'd like to thank distinguished Professor Anthony Forsyth from RMIT, who was instrumental in securing our wonderful keynote speaker for this evening's lecture. I personally look forward to hearing the insights of Professor Stiglitz, but I also look forward very much to our future support for this important annual series. Thank you all. Thank you very much, um, Alec. So colleagues, uh, we now uh, would like to uh, share with you uh, a short video um, uh, about Laurie Carmichael. We can then say truly and justifiably that education and training, that learning is no longer the province that of learning elite. is no longer the province of an elite privileged section of our community, but is the right responsibility and opportunity of all working people within our country. 
Laurie was a giant of the Australian trade union movement. He was a working class intellectual. He was an educator and he was respected by everyone who ever dealt with him. Laurie Carmichael was not only a dedicated union believer, but he fundamentally believed in the importance of um, high quality vocational education at TAFE as crucial for the workers uh, and for the economy and for a healthy labour market. He was a very passionate person and that passion showed through his speaking at public meetings where everybody would often comment on just how passionate he was on his feelings. I think one of the great recognitions of Laurie was that the more conservative forces in the trade union movement embraced Laurie as a significant figure in Australia and regardless of him being a member of the Communist Party until his death, he probably had more influence on workers' wages, conditions, technology and lives than any other union official ever in this country. And Marx's conception of socialism was that it would be and create the most democratic type of society known to mankind. In 1969, I refused to register and be conscripted for the Vietnam War. I was jailed for two weeks, and in the process, my mother was dragged across the ground by police, and my father arrested by the police for coming to her aid. My father um, was very involved and interested in um, many things, and uh, particularly took a year off uh, when he was with the metal workers to um, be a research officer and to read and read the latest economics and uh, political literature at the time so he could develop strategies that would help him win into the future. That he took a whole year off from being a union organiser, trying to understand what was the situation at the time, how to learn from the latest in terms of economics and political strategy and develop it and use it for the future. You know, Laurie's legacy in this place is really uh, ensuring for us that we can build that deeper understanding of the collective power of unions and the importance of building that just uh, civil and progressive society for all. mighty and fearless leader of the uh, trade union movement who we are very proud to stand alongside, Sally McManus. Uh, thank you, Karina. Also, I um, want to acknowledge country as well and say that the ACTU supports the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, it's great to be here to launch the first Laurie Carmichael lecture by the Carmichael Centre. The ACTU, the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union, the Australian Education Union are very happy to be the funding partners for the Carmichael Centre, which is hosted at the Centre for Future Work. The centre honours Laurie Carmichael's life and ongoing legacy. The truth is, I'm sure, many people in this audience would not be aware of Laurie's extraordinary contribution as a trade unionist. So I want to start by saying a few words about Laurie and why our movement chose to honour him with this research centre. Laurie Carmichael was a visionary, he was an intellectual, he was an organiser, he was a change maker, he was a communist, as you just heard, and a trade unionist through and through. Laurie was part of a long and proud tradition of working class intellectuals who found voice, their community, uh, in the collective power of the trade union movement. They used that power to transform Australia for the better. Laurie Carmichael started at the Williamson uh, uh, Naval Dockyards, which I do believe is only five kilometres away from here. And uh, there he joined the Amalgamated Engineering Union, a forerunner of today's AMWU. He was elected as his union's Melbourne District Secretary in 1958 and in 1972 became the Assistant, National Assistant Secretary in the newly formed Amalgamated Metalworkers Union. He was elected as ACTU Assistant Secretary in 1987 but his influence didn't derive from his impressive list of titles. Laurie was completely dedicated to rank and file union organising and to action, to support 
and the to support and educate union delegates. His union was a member-led uh, union and it was his direct connection to his members which was a true source of Laurie's influence. His union was famous for winning advances in pay and conditions that would flow on to other sections of the workforce. I do wonder whether that's the wage price spiral they may be talking about today. This happened against the stubborn resistance, of course, of government and big business. In 1964, the then Minister for Labor, Billy McMahon, said that Carmichael was one of the most evil men in the trade union movement. So coming from Billy McMahon, I think it's more of a compliment than an insult. Laurie was at the forefront of campaigns against the Menzies government, government's penal powers, the anti-union laws that stop workers from taking industrial action. Mass worker action in 1969 um, effectively saw the ending of these laws. Across his career, Laurie directly contributed to countless wage rises and improvements in conditions including leading the campaign for the 38-hour um, working week. He was a vital force behind the accord between the ACTU and the ALP government to lead to the epic reforms like Medicare and universal superannuation. And I want to acknowledge that Bill Kelty, his partner with this, is um, here today as well. He was an internationalist. One of his proudest accomplishments was his involvement in the movement against the war in Vietnam. Laurie was there and this was very much, when it was very much a minority cause and not popular. He recounted his first peace rally in 1965 when there was just 50 people there. In May 1970, more than 100,000 protested in Melbourne for peace in the famed Monitorium March. Laurie was integral to the organising of these protests through his role in the Melbourne Peace Committee. These mass protests, of course, didn't just happen. It required hard work over many years by people such as Laurie who were willing to build um, something small into a genuine mass movement. Laurie was a great believer in worker education. He dedicated a significant part of his life to enhancing vo vocational education and connecting it to the emerging needs of a modern workforce. That is why the AEU is one of the sponsors. The education programs Laurie put together for his union were legendary. They connected theory to practice and empowered workers to take more informed action. He took a great interest in changes in technology and the future of the world of work. He was always future focused. He saw the future as a site of contest. At the time, at a time of massive technological change for his industry, Laurie identified the major threats posed by computerization, which is a funny word, isn't it? We don't really use that now, digitalization, and new forms of communication. He also saw the opportunities. He believed that workers needed to be proactive in educating themselves about these technological changes and gaining new skills required to thrive in a future economy. He knew to do this, they needed to be organized in their unions to take action to make sure the changes happened on their terms. They could shape the inevitable change, not just be victims of it. But this required strong unions advancing workers' interests at these, in these times of change. Laurie passed away in August 2018. But his legacy endures and the lessons of his long and remarkable time as a unionist lives on. Tonight, we're so honoured to hear from Professor Joseph Stiglitz about the economic importance of unions. I don't want to steal his thunder, but there are some really fundamental um, lessons from Laurie's life and activism that we should mention. During his union campaign for the shorter working week, Laurie wrote the big business and its political allies said this, he wrote this, they will try to show that the shorter working hours, hours of work would not be good for the country and that unions are ruin, ruining the country. Sound familiar, hey? I was reminded of this recently when the union movement's argument for an increase to the minimum wage resulted in an historic wage increase for a quarter of working people, 5.2% for those on the minimum wage and 46 for those relying on award wages. We, of course, were inundated with accusations that we were wrecking the economy, 
and that unions would drive up inflation and ruin the country. The same is happening now for any union who dares ask for a pay rise that keeps up with the cost of living, despite increasing productivity, despite record profits, despite um, low unemployment, all, of course, to protect um, capital's profit share. It seems, of course, the more things change, the more they stay exactly the same. Laurie never apologised for taking action to improve the lives of working people, and neither do we today. But he did believe that unionists needed to be educated on economic realities to rebut our opponents who speak of the national interests, where really they're talking about self-interest. So it's in Laurie's footsteps today, the union movement ensures that the voices of workers are heard in the debates about Australia's economic future. And we say unapologetically, Australia's future prosperity will, built, will be built on supporting workers and their unions. The economy just does not exist just in spreadsheets or shareholders' reports, it is not what first year economic subject textbooks theorise or what abstract projections would like it to be. The economy is working people wondering how they will make ends meet when interest rates go up but their wages do not. There are powerful economic and political interests in our country who oppose every improvement to workers' lives and conditions by saying it's bad for the economy. And every time, every time we do so, the union movement um, um, will stand up to them. We're the creators and the guardians of the workers' rights that allow us to live decent lives outside of work. We are the creators of a new future, of a better future, based on growing and a productive economy that is built on decent work and well-paid jobs. An economy that allows working people to pursue their ambitions in the workplace, enjoy their lives outside of work and be recognised for the contribution that we make to our society. This is the economic but also the moral case for unionism. And it's by building this better future together that we honour the legacy of Laurie Carmichael. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Sally. And now the moment we've all been waiting for. Um, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce, uh, to deliver the inaugural Laurie Carmichael Lecture, uh, Professor Joseph Stiglitz. Welcome. Well, it's a real pleasure to be uh, here in uh, Melbourne again. And uh, it's a special pleasure to uh, be giving this inaugural lecture in, in honor of uh, uh, a great uh, union leader who, uh, who did so much uh, to increase the living standards, not only of workers, but of all Australians. The topic uh, that uh, I'm going to talk about is um, the role of unions uh, in the modern economy. And I want to begin, though, with uh, a little bit of historical uh, uh, reference. Uh, it's important to remember why unions originated uh, in the first place. Um, before unions, uh, in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, uh, wages actually went down. Working conditions uh, got worse. Uh, any of you read uh, Dickens? Um, know how bad conditions, work, working conditions were in the middle of the uh, uh, 18th, 19th century uh, in the UK. And this was in a period of what was called the Industrial Revolution, where there were supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, GDP was going up, uh, living standards, uh, incomes were going up, but not for large fractions of the working population. So workers were facing uh, low wages, poor working conditions. Um, even as recently as the early part of the 20th century, uh, working conditions were terrible. In, in the United States, uh, they were brought home, uh, 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 how bad conditions were, was brought home by uh, the fact that workers were actually locked up in their factories and uh, this, uh, w 
there was a one event in the United States that, that stands out is uh, they were locked up and there was a fire and uh, hundreds of people died in the, the triangle shirt uh, waste uh, fire. Um, and uh, all of that uh, provided impetus not only for unionization, but also uh, for social legislation. Um, but it's always been a struggle. Uh, employers have always resisted. Um, they always wanted to get labor for as a lower price as possible. Um, you know, uh, in the early days uh, of the founding of America, uh, uh, the way we got uh, cheap labor was slavery from Africa. Uh, that was really cheap labor. Um, we didn't pay them anything and uh, we exploited them as, uh, until they died. Um, and that was really how to, you know, when they couldn't get uh, slaves, uh, they tried to uh, have frameworks that may work in wages uh, as uh, uh, low as possible. So there, it's always been uh, this kind of a struggle. And in the United States, uh, the critical moment was uh, during the, after the Great Depression, FDR, uh, uh, we passed uh, uh, the Wagner Act uh, that provided the framework for uh, collective action. And it has only been through the collective action of unions that workers' conditions got better. And uh, the unions really made uh, a very big difference for uh, and it, in the United States, opened up uh, a world in which we all became middle class, or so we thought. Um, so uh, uh, it, it uh, led uh, to reversal of these uh, uh, terrible conditions that had prevailed uh, since the beginning of the Industrial uh, Revolution. Well, as I said, it was always a struggle and uh, after the Wagner Act was passed in the United States, uh, employers whittled away at those rights. Uh, and they did it uh, in one way or another, including through legislation, um, especially in states that were control, where, where uh, workers did not, you know, were quite frankly controlled by Republicans. Um, I, I know I should. It does, Shouldn't be partisan here, but it is actually the truth. Um, so, so they got whittled away, and and uh, they passed laws like the right to work uh, law. Right to work law wasn't a right to work. Everybody had it. It was really the right to free ride. Uh, it was free. The unions were working to increase living conditions and increase uh, wages, uh, working conditions and increase. Uh, uh, wages, and it was an attempt to uh, allow pe workers to benefit from the negotiations of the unions without contributing. But of course, what the unions were providing was a public good for all workers. And in the presence of free riders, we know what happens. You will have an undersupply of these critical services. And that was part of a process of the evisceration uh, of uh, workers' powers, of unions, that led to uh, worse uh, working conditions and uh, lower wages. Uh, it was only through collective action that workers were able to uh, improve them, uh, their well-being. And I, this is a, a theme I want to emphasize. Um, in my book, in my recent book, uh, People, Power, and Profits, I talk about the need for collective action in a whole uh, variety of, of areas. Um, and that, that need for collective action uh, is even greater in a modern economy. We have to have collective action to provide education, health, uh, research, infrastructure. 
not only hard infrastructure, but the soft infrastructure related to, say, provision of, of uh, child care. Um, collective action in a modern economy is e obviously so much more important than it is in a simple primitive economy where people are just farmers. Um, and it's going to become even more important as we move to an innovation, an innovation economy. Well, one of the things I emphasize in my book is that there are multiple forms of collective action. We often think of government when we think of collective action, but uh, civil society uh, and uh, among the forms of collective action where groups of people get together and work together for a common cause are unions. And so that uh, is, uh, in, in a way, from a theoretical perspective, the key function of unions uh, in our society. Um, the importance of workers' collective action working together is, if anything, increasing because of the increased concentration of market power. Something I documented in my book, but it's also been documented in a, a large uh, uh, body of academic literature. And the point is that this increased concentration of market power by corporations um, means it's more, even more important to have a countervailing uh, power in the way that uh, Galbraith talked about it in the form of unions. But just when unions are most needed as a, a share of the labor force, particularly in the private sector, they become uh, very small, uh, especially in the United States, but in Australia and, and in many other advanced countries. Uh, the consequences is that in the absence of strong unions, what we're seeing is a new form, and, and, and in the absence of, of the political support that unions get, have for strong government action to protect workers, there are a whole new form, uh, forms of abuse of workers that have arisen. Uh, it, uh, for, in the United States, we have uh, the problems of uh, split schedules where people have to work uh, a few hours in the morning, then they get time off, and they few a few hours in the uh, in the evening. Uh, they uh, the, making their effective pay very low. Um, they have just in time scheduling, so they can't uh, organize their lives, including uh, uh, childcare. Um, their um, uh, working conditions where workers. Uh, in one of the richest companies in America have to stand for hours without being able to sit. And they're getting paid uh, miser really wages that are uh, unbelievably low uh, in the United States because we don't have strong unions and unions have not been able to push for good legislation. Uh, wages at the bottom adjusted for inflation are at the same level that they were more than 65 years ago. So can you imagine not having a pay rise in 65 years? And you're watching TV, and a lot of people seem to be doing very well. Even in the middle of the United States, there have not been increases in income adjusted for inflation for more than four decades. And if you don't have unions advocating for the, the well-being of all people, you, you wind up with healthcare systems where things are so bad that life expectancy in the United States has been on decline even before the pandemic. That the advances, you know, it's not like in the United States we don't have good uh, doctors, we don't understand medical science but we don't have a system that delivers health to ordinary people. And that is why life expectancy has been on decline. Well, um, the lack of balance of power in our economy 
is manifesting itself in many uh, different forms, uh, many different ways. Uh, the most striking is what I just emphasized, the increase in inequality in our society, uh, where uh, the top 1% gets 20%, uh, 25% of the income and twice that amount of the wealth. And uh, things have been getting uh, increasingly worse. Uh, but it's not just uh, these adverse effects on what it does to our um, to to inequality. It actually hurts our economy. It hurts our democracy. It really divides our society. When foreigners, uh, when people look at America and they say, "How could you have somebody like Trump?" Uh, and you see then what has been happening to the growth of inequality in our society, it becomes more understandable. <laughs> when you see what, the fact that, that those at the bottom have not gotten a pay raise in 65 years, I mean, not that they've worked that long, but over two generations, when you realize that this will be, and this is not only in the United States, but in many other countries, this will be the first generation that is worse off than their parents. Uh, and what does that do to uh, the nature of a society when there's no hope and that no aspiration? Um, so uh, this uh, uh, lack of balance of power has resulted in this growth of inequality, which is undermining our democracy, but it's also undermining our economy. It actually leads to lower productivity. It leads to a less well-performing economy. Uh, that was one of the central themes of another one of my books called The Price of Inequality. And, and the, uh, the title was you know, chosen because I said, we were paying a high price for the high level of inequality uh, that, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of discussion uh, in many countries, including Australia, what contributes to inequal to productivity? Well, one thing that harms productivity is high levels of inequality. But there are, and the, in my in my book, I I delineate uh, the variety of channels through which inequality undermines uh, a country's economic performance. Uh, when I wrote the book, uh, some people thought this was a, a little bit of a radical view. But in the decades since I wrote that book, it's now become mainstream. Even the, you know, the IMF, which I, I, for those of you who don't know, it's not a left-wing organization, um, has said that inequality is bad for economic performance. It leads to lower growth, more volatility. So a country concerned about greater performance ought to be concerned about making sure that there's not this growth of inequality. And the only, only way that, uh, or at least one of the principal ways in which this growth of uh, inequality can be stymied is through a better balance of power, and that means stronger unions. But unions play a role in an increase in productivity in another way. Um, it gives voice to workers in the workplace. And workers are the people who have actually the best information about what is going on in the workplace. And by giving them greater voice, uh, one has uh, the possibility of increasing productivity. Uh, it's part of the reason why, uh, you know, in, to look at, at, at one part of uh, one sector of our economy, uh, Massachusetts is the state, uh, a state in the United States where teachers' unions are particularly influential, particularly powerful. And it is the state which has the best performing education system. And I don't think it's an accident. It is partly 
It's not in spite of the unions, it's because of the unions, because the unions become a very strong advocate for strong investments in education and designing a, an education system that delivers. Well, um, the irony in, in a way is that the success of unions, especially through the political process, has actually weakened unions. And I know that's very frustrating for people in the union movement, but it is precisely because uh, in places where uh, they've been successful, people will say, well, we don't need, uh, we, we have good working conditions. What do we need unions for? You know, it's a little bit like what happened in banking uh, in the United States. Uh, in uh, early 1980s, um, under Ronald Reagan, uh, the, the Republicans said, we haven't had a banking crisis for 50 years. What do we need financial regulations? What do we need banking regulations for? And of course, the reason we hadn't had a, a financial crisis for 50 years is because we had financial regulations. And it's remarkable. It wasn't very long after we got rid of the, uh, re, even reduced the financial regulation, that we had a, our first financial crisis in 1989, just a few years, you know, within the term of one president. And then, it was just a little bit later than that that we had the really the global financial crisis, of, or what you call here the North Atlantic financial crisis of 2008. So it's very much the same way. When you have institutions that are working, you take them for granted, and then you say, well, what do we need them for? But it was precisely because we have those institutions that are delivering on those uh, basic goods um, that, that we, we have uh, those kinds of uh, uh, benefits, those higher living standards. Well, uh, not surprisingly, as uh, union power has decreased, there have been these reversals of the gains that I described before. And uh, what makes it even more difficult is that at the same time that uh, um, uh, the political power of unions has been weakened, economic conditions have also been uh, made life more difficult for unions. And I think the union movement has to recognize this and, and, and come to terms with it. So, it's easier to unionize when you have large enterprises, big companies, manufacturing uh, enterprises, or big, big companies. But we are evolving towards a service sector and innovation economy, and uh, uh, this average size of the establishments in that kind of service sector economy is smaller, and that's going to make uh, unionization more difficult, but not impossible, as many of you know. I mean, there, there are many, some unions here that are, are unions of, of service sector workers, and one of the strongest unions uh, in, uh, in the United States is the SEIU, the, the um, um, and so um, uh, the, the, um, uh, it is possible, and in fact, I would say it's even more important for there to be unionization. Uh, and the reason is pretty clear that uh, workers are even, their bargaining power is even weaker uh, in these contexts. Um, and uh, the platforms, as, as an example, uh, uh, like Uber, have really weakened the power of workers. Uh, of the uh, they're even their working conditions in many ways are worse than uh, ordinary old-fashioned taxi cab drivers. Um, the arguments you will hear from uh, Uber, uh, from from um, uh, the other platforms, is the uh, drivers are independent contractors. 
They're working for themselves. Uh, and that argument that they're working, you know, that they're independent contractor has been as an excuse for not giving them any benefits. Uh, no sick leave, not contributing to uh, retirement benefits, no health benefits, uh, leaving them really bereft. Um, and it's an argument not for, uh, against even the minimum wage. After all, they're just independent contractors. In New York City, uh, the Taxicab Commission did a study of what was the effective wage that uh, Uber drivers were getting. Because, and it, it, one of the interesting things about the platforms is you can monitor more easily what was going on because you can see when they're on the platform and you can see when they're looking for a job and what, what, what their income is. The uh, average wage of our taxi cab drivers was about $6 an hour. Uh, and, and you, you know, and it, the result of this is it was actually dangerous because in order to make a barely livable income, they had to drive for 12, 14, 15 hours a day, and at that point they were dangerous. So there, there, you know, it's it's a question of the health and safety, not only of the drivers but those who are being driven. Well. Uh, the fact that there, it is a platform doesn't change the fact that there is abuse of workers. And, but it does make, it may make uh, organizing the workers more difficult. It makes it more important to uh, argue for them. But it, uh, um, now, uh, just one more anecdote I, I, I want to uh, talk about uh, why it's so important is illustrated by what happened in COVID-19, um, uh, where uh, the, the um, workers, the frontline workers had to go to work and were exposed to the disease. And, and uh, as you all know, and it's true not only in the United States, but in other countries, uh, lower income people were not only more exposed, they had poor health conditions, and especially in the United States because we don't have a public health system, and they died in much larger numbers, and they got the disease in larger numbers. And um, the, uh, we had legislation that should have protected them. We have an uh, office of uh, health and safety uh, in the workplace. But unfortunately, this was during uh, uh, the Trump administration, they didn't believe in government protecting workers. And so they didn't do anything to make sure that workers had protective gear, were socially distanced, wore masks, they didn't do anything. And not surprisingly, in some uh, uh, context where people were particularly close together, like meatpacking, they were, uh, they died in record numbers. But uh, in uh, places like New York, where you had strong unions, the unions came in and said, say in the context of butchers, you know, in, in grocery stores, and said, you have to give us masks, allow us to be socially distanced. They stepped in where the government should have been and protected workers from the ravages of the disease. And this is just one illustration, but a very dramatic one of the kind of role that unions have to play, particularly when government isn't playing the role that it should be. But these are issues where Clearly, unions have to take a political role because they have they should be protecting not only their own workers but advocating to make sure that all workers uh, are protected. Well, uh, as I say, it's going to be uh, a greater challenge going forward uh, 
to make sure that uh, uh, workers are organized because the marketplace is going to be more fragmented. And uh, I think um, it's possible, and, and some of the most successful unions have succeeded in doing that. Um, I think um, uh, it's uh, uh, even more important, as I say, uh, that strengthen unionization uh, because of the growing imbalance uh, of power. Well, that leads me to the final set of remarks I want to uh, make, which is, what is the agenda uh, that uh, might redress some of these imbalances that I've described? And this is actually a very exciting time to be in Australia because you've just elected a labor government. Uh, <laughs> So the question is, uh, what should you ask of your labor government? Uh, the title of the party, labor, uh, mean, suggests that it should be working for ordinary Australians, and including workers. So I think, I hope uh, that they are open to a, uh, a real, what is required is a, actually a very comprehensive agenda. I'm just going to be able to, in a few minutes, uh, list a number of things that ought to be done. Uh, I think it's, uh, there are actually a lot of things. I mean, things have been going bad for a very long time, and you're not going to be able to remedy them in one or two years. But it, one should have a vision of what kinds of things that one would like um, or, uh, and that you should demand uh, of your labor government. Well. Obviously, we're talking about unions, and the first place to begin is uh, reform of uh, in industrial labor relations uh, law, what we call labor law. And um, there are many aspects uh, of this, and I don't feel like I'm an expert on Australian labor law, but I know uh, a lot about uh, uh, American labor law and about uh, some, some, some things about uh, uh, European labor law. I've written a, uh, uh, with a, a group uh, in um, Europe, uh, a, a, a progressive um, called the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, a book called Rewriting the Rules of the European Economy, and we, with the Roosevelt Institute, we wrote, did a book called Rewriting the Rules of the uh, American Economy. And we devoted some time to the issue of labor law. And one, uh, two basic issues that I, I think have to be uh, addressed. Uh, the first is uh, the nature of, of bargaining. What can be bargained for? And how does bargaining occur? Uh, having sectoral bargaining, sometimes called here, I guess, pat a pattern bargaining. Uh, uh, rather than individual enterprises, just bargaining, uh, is an important way of increasing the bargaining power of workers. And one, one of the ways you know that is the resistance that employers give to it. If it didn't have any effect on bargaining power, they'd say, okay, go ahead, if you want that, fine. But the fact that they put up such resistance, and not only in Australia, in New Zealand, in Europe, in Germany, uh, is evidence, I think, that there is at least a very strong case that it would uh, change the nature of the, what comes out of the bargaining process. So that's an example of, of where industrial relations, uh, the, the, the bargaining process needs to be changed. Other examples of what you can bargain for. You know, it's not just wages and working conditions. Um, it's voice. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, voice in the workplace. Um, you know, there are lots of other things that are important to workers uh, that ought to be the subject uh, allowed to be part of bargaining. In fact, you know, workers wouldn't be 
using scarce capital, bargaining capital, if they didn't think it was important. So what is interesting is um, some of the neoliberals, people who don't believe in regulations, somehow have wound up believing in regulations against workers. <laughs> why, if they believe that free markets work, why don't they let workers and firms bargain freely? But obviously they're trying to, you know, let's, let's make clear, regulation, the deregulation movement wasn't about deregulation. It was about changing the regulatory environment to advantage some interest at the expense of others. Uh, it wasn't really about deregulation. And, and I think that's an important uh, thing to bear in mind. So one set of issues uh, clearly that has to be addressed is uh, the framework of bargaining and what can be bargained for. But a second really important set of things is uh, all the rules that affect uh, organizing workers. Uh, that one of the things that have been very, very clever about the right is that they understand transaction costs, they understand all the things that make it difficult to organize. And so rather than saying we're not gonna allow unions, they whittle away at the ability to unionize. And it's just very slow uh, whittling away. Uh, again, I don't know all the details. I, I've had a lot of interesting conversations while I've been here in Australia. But I've seen it uh, in the United States. Um, the Supreme Court uh, of the United States um, in, 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 uh, in a couple of amazing decisions. I mean, there, there have been even more amazing decisions about Roe versus Wade and, <laughs> and, and uh, 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 the uh, restraints on guns and, and uh, a, a delegation to, uh, 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 of authority to the EPA and environment they've also made, uh, not gotten as much attention, a number of decisions about unionization. One of them was that uh, migrant workers uh, are really treated, uh, you know, I've described how bad things are, among the workers who are the most badly treated are migrant workers. And migrant workers typically live in housing provided their, by their employer. Housing is really uh, an overly elegant word to describe the conditions under which they live. But they, they, they live in the accommodations, barracks, or whatever you want to call them. Well, they work and they live on this property. And the question is, can unions get access to the workers? And you would say, OK. Uh, they may not interfere with the work, but certainly when their workers are in the barracks, or what do you call their accommodations, they should be able to, the, the union organizers should be able to talk to them. And the Supreme Court said, no, private property, as we define it, says they have the right to stop any union organizer coming anywhere on their property which is basically makes it impossible to organize migrant workers. So that, that's a Supreme Court decision that is going to be very difficult uh, to reverse unless we do something about our Supreme Court. Another example is uh, they said that uh, the um, uh, the obligation of workers to join a union or pay for uh, a union in the public for the, you know, pay a contribution for the bargaining that public sector unions did was unconstitutional because it violated 
the right to free speech, the First Amendment. Now you scratch your head and you say, how does that violate the, the right to free speech? Uh, you have to understand the Supreme Court reasons backwards. <laughs> they're, they're, they wanted to find an argument of how they could stop unionization in the public sector. And they came up with this argument using the First Amendment. It is really mind boggling uh, where they've gone, but that has made it much harder for uh, public sector unions to be organized. So these are two examples, uh, two categories of reforms um, that I'm sure, you know, well, I've seen in every country, part of the neoliberal agenda was to weaken bargaining power and weaken the ability of unions to get together uh, uh, to, to organize. And that needs to be reversed. A second area uh, that is just getting uh, attention in the United States is the role of competition laws. And competition laws, one thinks of mainly affecting corporations. But the uh, firms have figured out how to engage in anti-competitive practices to weaken the bargaining power of workers, to weaken competition for workers, and then drive down their wages. Uh, one example of that is Apple was part of a ringleader to drive down the wages of their engineers who were the source of Apple's success. <laughs> and uh, you would have thought they would be thankful for the brilliance of their engineers. Uh, and the way they showed their gratitude was to make an agreement with all the other companies in Silicon Valley who hired these very te uh, advanced technical engineers to keep their wages, not to compete with each other. But that's at the high end, the low end, uh, many fast food uh, companies have non-compete clauses that uh, if you work for McDonald's, you can't quit and work for Burger King. Now, the origins of non-compete clauses had to something to do with worrying about stealing intellectual property. And people are scratching their head, what is the intellectual property in McDonald's? that Burger King doesn't know about. <laughs> this is nothing but an attempt to suppress wages, to increase the monopsony power of firms. And um, so one of the things that uh, Biden's, uh, Biden has been very uh, committed to doing more about competition, and this is one of the areas, but one needs to be uh, uh, very diligent in this area. A third area is corporate governance laws. Uh, I think it's important for workers to have uh, seats on uh, the board of directors. Uh, there needs to be a voice for workers when firms shut down a plant or when they, you know, it's not that they're, it's the only voice, but it needs to be a voice that is heard. And uh, it's not a panacea, it's, it, it's not going to solve all problems, but having the voice of workers, unions, on the board of directors uh, ought to be part of uh, good corporate governance. Uh, a fourth example, which is particularly relevant, I think, for Australia, is deals with the laws governing uh, pensions and other fiduciary uh, uh, laws governing fiduciaries. Uh, you're lucky to have a, a, a very good uh, pension scheme, uh, and the pension schemes have uh, begun to focus on ESG, environmental sustainable governance issues. But uh, among the issues that they ought to be focusing on is how the corporations that they are investing in are treating their workers. 
And uh, in the United States, uh, the laws for a long while had the view that if you were a fiduciary or if you were uh, responsible for a pension, you could not consider any of the ESG issues at all, including how, how workers were treated. You were only supposed to focus on short-term returns. Well, it seems very strange to me that workers, pension funds, should not have a voice in how the companies that they have invested in behave. You know, uh, if you own something, you should have a, a ability to, to say something. And um, it actually, over the long term, companies that ha behave better, I think, uh, do have higher returns. That goes with the idea I said before that that greater equality, greater voice is associated with greater productivity. So it's not as if they're going counter to each other, but short-term maximization is not necessarily consistent with long-term. Uh, short-term leads to higher labor turnover, uh, you know, workers get demoralized, it's part of the problem why in the United States there's this great resignation that many of you may have heard about. Workers really feel, you know, firms didn't treat their workers very well in the pandemic, and workers don't feel any loyalty to the firm. And that has undermined the ability of uh, the firm's, uh, it's, it's one of the sources of the supply problems that are now giving rise uh, to inflation. Well, um, there uh, uh, the, uh, still another area where I think uh, greater uh, some reform ought to be is um, I talked about the, what I've talked about so far are examples of reforms in what we might call the microeconomics, but they're also macroeconomics. Uh, today, the uh, Treasury in Australia announced a review of uh, the Reserve Bank monetary policy. One question that they ought to be asking is uh, addressing is governance of the RBI. You know, even if you believe in independence, the question is, who is sitting there making these judgments? And some countries have recognized that having a lot of people from what we would say Wall Street, from the financial sector, is not representative of all of society. And some countries have actually forbidden people from the financial sector being on their board, because they say that distorts decision making. But some countries have insisted, since one of the obligations of a central bank is to manage the economy in terms of growth and employment, there should be a representative of workers. Sweden, for instance, always has a representative of workers on their central bank. So the, the, that, I think, this is maybe an opportune time to raise this issue about whether in the governance of the central bank, uh, of an RBI, uh, I mean, the, the Reserve Bank, uh, uh, there should be a representative of, of, um, uh, of workers. Finally, uh, I think it's important to uh, make a more affirmative case uh, for unions of the kind that I've uh, been trying to make uh, this evening. Uh, for 40 years, uh, the dominant economic paradigm, policy paradigm, has been neoliberalism. Uh, it was a model that believed that there was no power anywhere, there was perfect competition, no firm had any power, no worker had any power. The word power was never used in economics. Um, that was for political science or some other discipline. And, um, uh, Economic models, 
based on that notion, obviously, we're not going to provide a good description or a good framework for policy for our actual economy. Well, we've had not only 40 years of neoliberalism in one country, we've had it in many countries. And I think we can say with a fair degree of confidence that that experiment has failed. And it failed to produce growth. Growth was actually lower in the 40 years of neoliberalism than it was before. And for reasons that are well understand, uh, can, uh, can be well understood. But what growth occurred was not shared. It all went to the people at the top. And that's why we wind up in the situation we are with growing inequality, this being the first generation that will be uh, uh, worse off uh, than its parents. So uh, there needs to be a, a, an understanding that we need a new economic framework, one in which there needs to be a better balance, um, a greater role for collective action, and an important part of that collective action has to be workers working collectively together through unions. Um, I think that uh, uh, that kind of uh, rethinking uh, where we understand the role, the importance of collective action, uh, unions, government, um, lots of other forms of collective action, uh, has to be at the center of this reconstruction of the economy. And uh, unions need not only to take a lead in uh, the uh, in this kind of collective action that I've described, but also in the advocacy of the change in an, away from neoliberalism and explaining why it is that neoliberalism failed and why we need uh, collective action. And I think this is uh, really imperative if uh, we are going to achieve uh, an economy uh, where uh, the well-being of ordinary citizens are advanced. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, colleagues, uh, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge that um, it's the ACTU executive uh, has another engagement, so uh, they will be quietly leaving. Um, but Sally, I forgot to give you a small gift, so we'll make sure <laughs> you get that one. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, we're going to move to a, a, a Q&A um, session. Before we start, Professor, I'd just really like to acknowledge uh, your uh, contribution tonight. Uh, one of the things that really sort of resonated with me is that I've just come back from the US and I've actually spent time with the Boston Teachers uh, Union and the American Federation of Teachers and certainly the issues of uh, inequality uh, run deep. You know, that, that struggle is global uh, because many of the issues that they're facing are issues that we're also facing. But I was also very privileged to hear from uh, the workers who are mobilising within Amazon, the Amazon Workers Union and also... Uh, within Starbucks and, you know, that mobilising and building workers' power, which is just so critical. But we've got some questions now from the floor. So I think the first one is going to be uh, presented by Michelle Purdy, who's the federal TAFE president from uh, our union, the AU, and that's going to be beamed in via video. Someone going to make the magic happen? In Australia, like America, employers complain all the time about shortages of skilled workers. 
yet employers and governments never put enough resources into high quality, accessible vocational education. We have a public vocational system called TAFE that was once the gold standard in the world, but has been undermined by years of austerity and privatisation. Can you discuss why things like training and vocational education are not given the resources they need? And how does the lack of public vocational education hold back productivity, technology and living standards? Uh, that's a, a really interesting question and illustrates, I think, part of the change in the structure of the economy that I mentioned uh, before. Um, when you had large enterprises uh, like General Motors that were the dominant form uh, and people stayed with the company for years or a whole lifetime, uh, General Motors could have its own training program and knew that it was going to, the workers that had trained would stay with it. Um, that's not the way we, a modern economy, you know, people live, are with a firm for a few years. And so uh, if you don't have public support for training and retraining, uh, you are going to wind up with a less educated labor force, a less skilled labor force than you need for the modern economy. Now, one of the good things is that uh, there are now new technologies using, uh, you know, what they call ed tech, uh, that are able to facilitate some of this training. So while the change in the economy has made it more difficult uh, more, more imperative that the government be involved, we have new technologies that may make it more accessible if there's adequate government support. So I, I really do think it's, uh, uh, this is an important part of, uh, you might say, the benefits that ought to be given to workers. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we'll now go to uh, Jacob Batt from the AMWU, and I think Jacob hopefully has got a microphone. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, uh, for that lecture. Um, obviously, unions in both Australia and America have been attacked for, for decades now. Um, and you, you spoke, um, I think, your first point around what it is we need to do now around bargaining systems. Obviously, in Australia, uh, we're limited to collective bargaining at individual enterprises. You were referring to uh, other systems like patent bargaining. Um, what is it that... Um, uh, why are we limited to collective bargaining with individual enterprises and what would be the benefits of introducing bargaining at a broader level? Well, I mean, it's in a way, um, you can see the, the um, if you're only one enterprise, uh, they'll say, if, you give, if I give you more higher wages, I'm not going to be able to compete with my rivals. And so you're setting everybody competing against each other. And it's undermining the collective nature of the bargaining process. You know, it would be like, at the other extreme, if you were bargaining just by yourself, you have no bargaining power. Uh, and you won't be able to get anything. That's why you have to collectively get together. But if it's only one enterprise, that has a lot less bargaining power than if it's the whole sector. So um, you can say, you know, it's, I, I think it's almost obvious that the wider the sector, you know, the wider the framework, the more the workers have uh, a greater bargaining power. Um, but at, at the most telling evidence is the what evidence I gave, the fact that employers are resisting it so much, they must believe that it, it's going to give workers more bargaining power. And, you know, when real wages have done so poorly, I think it's a prima facie case that workers' bargaining power has been eroded. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Professor. Uh, we've got another video now uh, from the AMWU, Mitch Best. Hi. We can then say truly and justly... Hobart, Tasmania. 
2013, Joe Hoffman, GM. I'm Mitchell Best. I'm a motor mechanic in Hobart, Tasmania. In 2013, Joe Hockey dared GM to leave. Joe Hockey was the federal treasurer of the coalition government. He said six words, you are here or you are not. In 2017, after nearly 100 years, Australia stopped manufacturing cars. In my experience, the importance of Australian manufacturing has been downplayed for decades. We seem to think that minerals and resources like coal, oil, gas are the main engine of our economy. Dig it up, ship it out. I got sick, sick of hearing Australian economists and politicians telling us that it was the workers' fault. And high wages and union demands made auto manufacturing uncompetitive. But I know that a nation like Germany have car manufacturing industries that are not only competitive, but provide workers with good pay, conditions and highly skilled jobs. My question to you, sir, is... Why does manufacturing matter for an advanced economy? And how would a car industry making sustainable electric vehicles pay good wages and conditions and still be competitive? Very good. I have to admit I was struggling myself. But, but, but let, me, let me try and then maybe you can uh, uh, help. Um, I think manufacturing... Uh, is an important part of the economy, but it's only uh, a, a small part and its role is diminishing. I, that's just a fact you, globally and within most countries. Uh, in the U.S., manufacturing is about 89% of uh, GDP and of employment. Um, and uh, the reason for that is very, very simple. It's, it's, success in productivity increases. That uh, we are, mo just like, you know, uh, 100 years ago, uh, or more, a little more than that, uh, you, the center of the economy was agriculture. People said, how can you have an economy in which uh, you don't have agricultural employment? 70% of the people were employed in agriculture. Well, today it's about two or three percent, and they produce more food than even an obese society can consume. So, the 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 wh why is that? We've gotten enormous productivity increases in agriculture, and that has enabled people to shift labor into other things, um, like education, like manufacturing. And so we're going to be going through another thing like that out of manufacturing into services, uh, you know, like education. Uh, the fact that we're living longer, health is going to take more of our income. Um, uh, culture, uh, you know, one of the benefits of leisure having a, that you don't have to spend all your time getting the basic necessities of life, of food, housing, and, and clothing, and so forth, is that you have time to do things that are really uh, uh, enjoyable, like, like uh, reading and, and writing and, and art and, and music and those other things. So I think those are where we, we will be going. And... Uh, it will be even more important to have policies that increase productivity in these other sectors. And new technologies will be enable, at least in some of the sectors, to have uh, significant increases uh, in productivity. You know, having said that, obviously we are v still very dependent on manufacturing. Um, and I think the pandemic exposed uh, the fact that uh, we have a less resilient economy, that we become too dependent on uh, imports. The United States couldn't even make simple products like masks or protective gear. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so uh, I think it will be 
important, you know, and, and there's a lot of learning benefit, uh, technology from, from those industrial processes. So I think manufacturing is going to continue to be important, but I think it w would be foolish to think it will be at the center of our economy. It's not at the center of the economy now. It's, uh, it's only nine, eight, nine percent. Thanks, Professor. And I think that the, the second part of the question really goes to the electrical uh, car industry as well and your reflections on uh, how we can ensure that that becomes a sustainable industry in terms of manufacturing. Oh, um, well, there are a couple of aspects of that. Uh, first, I mean, obviously, w whenever, whatever is produced, you have to think about the whole life cycle. And if you're producing electric cars, are environmentally sound only if the electricity that is used in the electric cars is produced in a environmentally uh, sound way. So if you are using coal to produce electricity for an electric car, that's really pretty dirty. So you, you, you have to look at this systemically. Now, Obviously, one of the concerns, increasing concerns, is that some of the uh, minerals that go into the electric car, uh, cobalt, or, are being mined in ways that are not environmentally sustainable. And I think uh, we, uh, obviously, this is an area where uh, a lot of research needs to be done mm -hmm. to, to develop uh, ways of make uh, batteries that are not so dependent on um, on on production that is not environmentally sustainable, or is done in a more sustainable way. Um, I think this is actually where some of the uh, focus on neoliberalism has been uh, particularly bad. The focus has all been on getting the price as low as possible in the short run. And we don't include all of the environmental cost in the price. And if we, you know, we might be able to get much more sustainable production of electric cars if we're willing to pay an extra 5%. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got one final question. So I'd invite uh, Nicole Cowan, Deputy Federal Secretary of the AU. Thanks. Thanks, Professor Stiglitz. Um, you touched on it in your address in relation to the US Supreme Court um, and in particular the decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. Um, it represents a major step backwards for women in the United States and indeed around the world. Um, here in Australia, women we know now make up the majority of union members and so this issue of reproductive rights and a range of other human and social rights are at the centre of trade union business. What are the economic and labour market consequences of limiting access to human rights? And what are the main economic arguments that we as trade unions must be making to support our work across the community to ensure that all human rights are protected? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. And, and uh, um, the, um, you know, we've been thinking a lot about uh, some of the consequences uh, of, the rep uh, of the reversal of Ro Roe versus Wade and what it is going to do for, say, women's opportunity. Uh, if you go to work for a company who uh, has an office in Texas, uh, it's very natural for a woman not to want to go to work in Texas as she's of childbearing age. And that diminishes her opportunities. Does that mean, it, it, it's, it's going to open up a whole wide range. So does that mean that um, if a firm has an established uh, branch, you know, economic activity in Texas, it inevitably has to discriminate against women. <laughs> Because it, if if they uh, uh, keep that branch, that means some of the opportunities within the firm will be closed off to her uh, because of Texas's policy. 
So uh, that's maybe you know a, an example of, of how the abrogation of rights in one place in a world of globalization, this is just within America's borders, has implications for how the labor market works uh, in other places. Uh, we, we live in a too integrated world to ignore the, the uh, violation of human rights. Um, you know, the way I think about this is, you know, a violation of an individual's uh, human rights in any place is violation, you know, in all places. It, it, you can't have this uh, selectively. Um, and uh, I think the voice of, of unions is particularly important in this area. Um, you know, one of the functions I said of collective action of unions is voice uh, and to give voice that otherwise might not be heard. Rupert Murdoch has a way of getting his voice out there. Uh, he has lots of newspapers. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's, uh, uh, but ordinary citizens really don't have much voice. And one of the ways that their voice gets expressed collectively is through the union. And I think the unions have a particularly important role then in, in articulating the importance of, of of these uh, human rights um, in uh, you know in all these uh, areas, um, um, there are some aspects of human rights which directly affect workers, and where I think the workers movement, uh, work union movements ought to be more vocal, uh, particularly more vocal. For instance, uh, I don't think it's widely known that about. 5% of the industrial output in the United States is done by prison labor and uh, paid almost nothing, like 25 cents an hour. You know, that's a violation of any kind of basic human right. And uh, there's a, I, some of you may have seen, uh, there's a documentary called the 13th Amendment because the 13th Amendment uh, to our Constitution is the amendment which freed the slaves and said there can't be involuntary servitude, but they made an exception. And that exception was to those who were in prison. And that had the perverse consequence of inducing a lot of, you know, the, the, the uh, huge number of African Americans that went to prison and uh, the involuntary, uh, the, the uh, involuntary servitude that they have in those prisons. So I think the global uh, labor movement ought to be, you know, particularly vocal about this kind of, of abuse uh, of uh, uh, involuntary servitude that is going on today in America. Thank you very much. Colleagues, uh, please join me in thanking Professor Joseph Stiglitz for his contributions tonight. <laughs> Professor, we have a small gift for you, a couple of books for you to uh, read on your journey home or uh, at some stage. So we really appreciate um, the time that you've taken tonight. It's been a very thought-provoking uh, conversation. Um, colleagues, as we wrap up, there are a, a number of thank yous uh, to make. These uh, nights don't just happen by themselves. And so I'd like to acknowledge uh, many of the people that have been involved um, uh, tonight. Thank you to uh, the funding partners, the ACTU, the AMWU and the AU. Thanks also to the Australian Institute and the Carmichael Centre at the Centre for Future Work. Thanks to RMIT for hosting the event in the gorgeous uh, theatre that we've uh, spent our evening in. I'd also like to say thank you to the Victorian Government and the Department of Education and Training uh, Victoria for sponsoring this event. And wait, there's more. I'd particularly like to acknowledge uh, Carmichael Cent Centre partners, uh, Sally McManus and Michelle O'Neill from the ACTU. Uh, my name's on here, but I might skip that and acknowledge Kevin Bates uh, from the AU as well. Andrew Detmer and Steve Murphy 
from the AMWU and uh, our VIPs that have been uh, in attendance tonight, Professor Alec Cameron from RMIT, uh, Doug Cameron in, uh, uh, joining us online, uh, Frank Cherry, AMWU, Betty Brent, AMWU, Colin Ormsby, AMWU, John Spate, AMWU, Steve Murphy, AMWU, uh, Bill Kelty, ACTU, Mary Stewart, ACTU, and Laurie uh, Carmichael, Jr., uh, joining us online. Can I also thank uh, the staff, RMIT, uh, Lauren Gothels, Tegan Dixon, Ravi Lama, Kate Tellenkamp, uh, Lauren Hessler, and Anthony uh, Forsyth, and from the ACTU, uh, Liam uh, Byrne, Pete McGrath, Francis Leach, and Kim Mack, and from the Australia Institute, the Centre for Future Work, and the Carmichael Centre, we're almost there, uh, Anna Chang, Hannah Brown, Cathy O'Sullivan, uh, Eleanor Johnston-Leak, Hayden Starr, Jake Wishart, Lily Raines, Fiona MacDonald, Jim Stamford, Mark Dean, Ben Oakquist and Ebony Bennett. Let's give them all a big round of applause. And as we, uh, as we finish up tonight, I'd just like to direct your attention to the work of the centre. Uh, and you can see behind us, we have a, a number of banners here. And if you're looking for more information, you can uh, go to the carmichaelcentre.org.au and we'd love your support for our ongoing work. So thank you very much for your attendance tonight. Uh, thank you once again, Professor Stiglitz. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, and safe travels home. Good evening, everyone. Oh, there you go. Oh, well done.